So with that, I am going to kick it over to Ed, W0YK. Uh, Ed, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Ken, and uh, welcome to everybody that's uh, tuned in here. Uh, this first slide shows the three people that um, are on the contest committee for this new contest. Uh, they've been instrumental, but there's been a whole host of other people that I'll review uh, at the end that have contributed to this. So it's not uh, certainly not a one-man show. I'll also add that um, I've put up a PDF of these slides on the homepage of the Worldwide Digi uh, DX Contest website. And um, so you can get those there. People have been asking for that in addition to the recording that uh, Ken and Mark will be putting up on the WWROF um, uh, uh, webinar archive uh, page. Okay, so if I can, there we go. So uh, I think uh, the impetus for this contest is probably pretty well understood, but just to review, uh, I think we've all been amazed by the uh, incredible adoption of the FT8 uh, signal technology over the past two years. It was introduced at the end of June in 2017 and immediately um, uh, overcame CW sideband and RIDI in terms of the number of QSOs submitted to Club Blog and the Logbook of the World. It was just uh, absolutely amazing. And prior to that, of course, the JT modes, the JT9 and JT65, were actually very popular outside of contests. They were uh, one of the most active modes and they went immediately to zero in terms of, of log submitted. Just the, the switch over, the transition to FT8 was just amazing. So uh, the worldwide DX contests, as uh, most everyone knows, are the most popular contests. They've been around for decades. They're kind of the granddaddy of, uh, of our contesting, of our, of our radio sport. And so the WWROF, in conjunction with the uh, Slovenia Contest Club, really wanted to uh, lead into the future and, and get this contest going this year. It's been on a very uh, uh, short fuse. As you can see here, I floated the idea to uh, Tim and, and Tini uh, S50A, the, the um, uh, president of, of the Slovenia so uh, Contest Club, and Tim Duffy, uh, K3LR, president of WWROF, back in Visalia. And um, less than uh, six weeks later, we had a press release. We had a website put together and uh, rules and so forth and did a press release at the end of June. A couple, year, uh, couple weeks later, we uh, did some uh, revisions to the rules, and I'm going to uh, talk about that. It really boiled down to um, getting our 2019 event in line with the vision. So we really do have a long time vision. This isn't just a short term, let's throw a contest out there. But uh, I had some thoughts on what we really wanted this contest to be uh, in the long term. And then I uh, had to look at what uh, could really be achieved here in a few months for 2019. And I say I got a typo there that should be 2019. Uh, surprised nobody's noticed that. So here's the vision, there are four points. And the first one I think is uh, pretty well known to a lot of people is to equalize the, the scoring level, of the playing field worldwide by using grid squares and grid fields. And I'll talk more about that in a minute and why we're using um, each of those instead of just uh, say grid squares. Uh, the second point is that we have the opportunity with this uh, technology to have true signal reports and they're for free. Uh, the operator doesn't have to do anything. They come uh, by virtue of the technology. They're calculated and can be sent out. And um, what I think is really exciting about that is that, uh, at least for me, it returns me to my novice days back in the 50s when uh, we thought about what the, the RST was that uh, we were uh, uh, receiving and we paid attention to what we heard back about our signal. And uh, that was a major part of the, of the QSO. And over the decades, it's evolved to just a perfunctory 599 or 5NN, and nobody thinks about it. It's just a sync pulse in the, in the stream of, of the QSO message. And uh, so this is a chance to return to our roots. And for me, it's not so much about, you know, whether you have points or, or uh, it's part of the exchange uh, in terms of the scoring, but it's more has to do with on a QSO by QSO basis, what does it mean when you're talking with your QSO partner and uh, you, you get the, an actual true signal report and know uh, what your signal's like on, on the other end. So I think that's, um, that's, that's pretty exciting. The third thing is that because we're using grid squares uh, and, and signal reports, that 
the interoperability with non-contesters can uh, has a potential to be completely transparent. That is, you can work a contester, or you can work a non-contester in this contest, and he doesn't even have to know that there's a contest going on. He just has a QSO. You get credit for it. The proper exchange is made, and everything's copacetic. And what this means is that everybody that's on the air that has their radio turned on can um, participate in this event, even if they don't know the events going on, and even if they don't know that they just made a so-called contest uh, uh, contact. So I, I think that's a, a really positive thing for uh, for ham radio overall, as radio as ready, as well as um, as radio sport. And then the fourth point uh, kind of goes without saying. This whole thing came about because we've got a revolutionary uh, new signal mode. It's deeply sensitive. As uh, many of you know, it's uh, so sensitive that you can work stations you can't even hear. It's below the, the human um, threshold of hearing, uh, below the noise level. And the signals themselves, the tr transmitted signals, are very narrow with near vertical skirts. They don't flare out like a, uh, a teletype signal. I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. And thirdly, uh, there's near perfect copy. In fact, you can just say perfect copy because there's forward error correcting and that completely obsoletes uh, super check partial. There's no need to guess what the call sign is out of a list of other call signs. You either get the call sign or you get the message or you get nothing. And so uh, it's a, a pretty amazing uh, technology. And because it's a multi-channel technology, you've basically got a narrow band skimmer uh, for every, uh, you know, while, while you're operating. You're, you're operating as though you were uh, operating a, a skimmer, it, although it's, of course, narrow band for uh, your, the pass pan of your, of your radio. And so this offers the opportunity to have multiple parallel QSOs. That is, you can carry on two or three or more QSOs in parallel and really uh, increase the speed for those times when you have um, enough uh, potential stations to work at, at one point in time. So that's the vision. That's uh, what this contest is uh, aiming for, what it's all about. And as I said, there's some practical limitations for uh, the contest. It's gonna be three weeks from now in terms of uh, how much of this we can, uh, we can achieve. And so here's where some of the limitations are. I'm gonna go through that with you so we can uh, clarify uh, what the actual contest is going to be doing in terms of rules and capability versus what the vision is and where we hope to be uh, uh, later on in the future with, with future contests. So the blue areas here on this slide are, are ones that I'll talk about where um, we're not quite up to par on the, uh, on the vision. But starting with the first point, let's go through and, and talk about um, uh, grid fields. Grid fields are the first two letters of um, a grid square or any of the maiden hair head um, locator system uh, designators. And there are 324 of those, 18 by 18 across the world. So the world's divided into equal uh, grid fields that are about two and a half by four and a half uh, kilometers or thousand kilometers uh, in size. And so uh, this completely eliminates the geopolitical um, uh, scoring systems that we have in, in most of our, of our contests. And these are what we're gonna be using for, um, for multipliers. So instead of countries or other kinds of multipliers, grid fields will, will be the multipliers. Now, as you can see, a number of the multipliers are out in the middle of the ocean where there's no land, no inhabitants. And so uh, you don't have 324 available on any given contest weekend. You know, it's more like 150 to, to 200 will probably be uh, actually um, achievable. And then a grid square takes each of those grid fields and divides it up into 100 more grids from 00 to 99. And so this is an example of the IO um, grid field uh, that encompasses most of the United Kingdom. Okay, so just in review, uh, grid fields are uh, two letters, the first 18 letters of the alphabet A to R. Uh, so example of the grid field that I'm in here in California is Charlie Mike and uh, 18 by 18 equal grids across the world, uh, 324 total. For grid squares, there are 180 by 180 equal grids uh, when you add the, uh, the two digits on the end. So again, my grid field, I mean my grid um, uh, square is Charlie Mike 97. And at the bottom here is, the, uh, is, is a link you can go and read uh, more than you probably wanna know about the Maidenhead uh, locator system. So basically, uh, for the scoring system for QSO points, we're gonna use grid squares. We're gonna use the finer granulation 
to get a more accurate distance. And then we um, uh, divide that down by 3,000 uh, kilometers per point so that we wind up with a range of one to seven points per QSO, depending on how far uh, the distance is between you and your QSO partner. For multipliers, though, we don't want to use that kind of granularity because that really dilutes the value of multipliers. There's no reason to work a, a grid square on the other side of the world when you've got hundreds of them uh, close to you that, that you could be working. And so we we'll use grid fields for that, which is, encourages you to do DXing, which is what the worldwide DX contests are all about, and to turn your beam and to try to work that grid field uh, on a certain band uh, you know, further away and, and so forth. So to give you an example, uh, from here on the West Coast, from California, uh, show you kind of what uh, how the points work out. So if you work uh, through most of the United States, uh, you'll get one point, like into the Midwest from, from California. Uh, if you work into the East Coast, uh, you get into uh, two points. And into Japan is three points, into Europe is uh, four points. Uh, five points into Eastern Australia, uh, six points down to um, South Africa and seven points on the other side of the world. Uh, basically, that's close to Amsterdam Island, for example, out in the Southern uh, Indian Ocean. If uh, you're in Europe and uh, you look, say, in, in Germany, uh, into Moscow is a, a single point. So a lot of uh, your European contacts will, do, will just be a single point. Down to Cape Verde is two points. Into the East Coast of the USA is three points. Into the Northwest uh, area of uh, South America is four points. Uh, Western Australia is five points, Eastern Australia is six points, and New Zealand is seven points. So kind of gives you an idea, depending on where you are in the world, as to uh, how your points will, uh, will line up. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the exchange. Uh, you know, in the vision, we said that uh, grid square and signal report uh, would be uh, what we'd like to have in the exchange. But it turns out there's a technical uh, constraint right now because in the FT uh, protocol, there's only 16 bits available for the exchange. And for grid square, you need 15 bits. So it only leaves one bit left, which of course isn't enough for uh, signal to noise ratio. And in fact, nine bits are, are needed for that. So the alternative is to send two exchange messages, which is shown here in, in green, uh, sending the, the signal report in addition to the, the grid square which lengthens the QSO by two uh, message uh, transmissions to uh, two uh, cycles uh, back and forth on, on, the, uh, on the transmission. And so in the end, we decided uh, that that uh, was kind of anti-contesting to lengthen the message as opposed to uh, keeping it short. So for this contest, we're just going to exchange uh, grid square. And meanwhile, we're looking uh, with the WSJT development team uh, on um, methods uh, techniques that would allow us to uh, exchange uh, both of those. And there are a number of ideas that are in mind, and we'll just have to see what, uh, what can be worked out in, in that regard. The third point was interoperability with non-contesters, and uh, we have that. In fact, technically, it works, um, it works great. You could have a non-contester running the standard WSJT messages, which do include um, signal report and grid square with the messaging that I just showed uh, earlier. Uh, they could work a contester with a shorter message stream that just has grid square, and it's completely automatic and uh, transparent between both message systems until a human being gets involved. And by that, what I mean is that the non-contester in particular, especially if he doesn't realize there's a contest going on, may be confused and disturbed that the contester doesn't send him a signal report. And uh, in fact, you may think that the QSO isn't valid since he didn't receive a, a signal report. This is uh, why uh, we're not completely transparent yet, um, and it ties back to the uh, to the to the messaging. And then finally, on the um, on the signal characteristics, the last point of of that list there, multiple parallel QSOs. There's no uh, suitable way uh, available today to really do that, and so um, that's really not, uh, you're not able to do that in the contest this time. It's part of the rules, it's uh, available, but um, there's no practical way to do it. So people may say, wait a minute, you know, the, the expeditions for the last couple of years have been using this fox and hound mode, and um, it turns out that that's, um, 
not a uh, suitable thing to use for uh, contesting. And the reason for that is that uh, it creates uh, some tremendous IMD pro uh, products by the fox, by the transmitter. And in a contest situation, there's many foxes, right? I mean, uh, any anybody could be uh, using this mode and it would just fill up the band with um, with IMD. So let's look at the uh, the signals. Here's, uh, this is showing four signals. On the far left is a typical RIDI signal. And this uh, alludes to what I was talking about earlier about um, you know, a, a signal that's only you know, 170 hertz between the two tones, but as you go down the skirts, they flare out uh, pretty radically. And if you have a strong signal, that is uh, somebody running high power with, uh, you know, good location and good antennas, they can obliterate weaker signals on each side, their their neighbors there. And that's been a chronic problem in, uh, in RIDI contesting. And the first um, uh, introduction of FT8 <clears throat> up until the, the release of just uh, last month, in fact, uh, the uh, FT8 signal is an FSK-like signal, and it also flared out, as you can see here, the second signal from the left, not as, as much as, as RIDI, but it still had those flared out um, uh, skirts. And with this last release, uh, the, the development team has added what's called GFSK, added Gaussian smoothing to the uh, signal. It's kind of like taking, uh, you know, um, changing the rise and fall times of a CW signal so you eliminate clicks. Uh, that's uh, an analogy of what's being done here. It basically smooths out those those transitions, the uh, on and off transitions of, of the signal, so that they're um, uh, a bit rounded on the edges. And look what it does to the RF spectrum. It's just, um, it's just pretty amazing. And so those two signals on the right are uh, FT8 and FT4. FT4 is a little bit wider. Um, and they get uh, uh, the, the faster speed, double the speed by widening the, uh, the signal and uh, reducing the sensitivity a bit. So that's what the signals uh, look like, which is a tremendous uh, contribution uh, to the hobby uh, and to the state of the art to, uh, to have signals like that that can really squeeze in and occupy a lot, a lot more signals can occupy the, uh, the band. So here on the left is what the audio signal looks like of say an FT4, uh, signal. And on the right, when you run it into a transmitter, in this case a, a flex, uh, what it looks like on the air. And you can see it still maintains a 80 dB uh, near vertical sides with uh, nothing coming up uh, in, the, in the skirts. But look at what happens if you use the fox and hound mode. And on the left here, this is three transmitted audio signals. So this would be the fox transmitting uh, three QSO messages to three different um, um, QSO partners in parallel. And look at what happens on the right with the on the air signal. This is the same radio, but when you run more than one audio signal through it, it's like, um, it's analogous to using, uh, doing a, a two-tone sideband test. In this case, it's three tones. And this is uh, where, uh, you know, a lab will, uh, will test a, a sideband transmitter to see what the IMD products are. And of course, this is what you get, and you can you can measure these things. They're down 35 to, to 40 dB, but uh, you really don't want a whole bunch of people uh, displaying their uh, two-tone or three-tone testing on the bands because now this is as bad or worse than the uh, the RIDI signals that we showed showed earlier. Now, in a practical uh, situation, if you had a bunch of these signals on the band, could you copy through it? Yes, a lot of it could be copied but uh, a lot of the weaker signals could not be copied. And so it would uh, really detract from uh, the experience for everybody and uh, completely nullifies the great progress that these people have made on the signal. So uh, this is something that we don't want to encourage. And so while the, the technique of multiple QSOs is not uh, outruled by the contest, what is outruled is uh, signals that are, have this bad of quality and there's no no transmitter today that, that can avoid this. It's just a characteristic of transmitters. So probably in the future, uh, if we figure out a way to do multiple parallel QSOs, it won't be using a technique like this. We've done some experimenting with pre-distortion on uh, radios and that hasn't been too fruitful so far, but um, you know, maybe something will pan out more uh, on that in the future. But uh, we've got some technology to work in the, uh, on in the, in the hobby to get further along on this. Okay, let's move on to the software. This is um, a bit of a busy slide, but 
Um, there are a number of, of software packages available, and there are some um, key differences between them that um, are uh, sorted out here on, on this slide. So I've shown two columns here, and that is what software you might be using for the modem. That is the software that decodes and encodes the uh, FT signals, and then what uh, software you might be using for logging. And the top two entries on the logging side, N1MM Plus and Write Log, are the only two uh, really contest loggers that are integrated with this new technology. And um, they would be preferable for a, for a serious contester because they provide dupe checking, scoring, uh, SO2R, multi-op capability, all the things that are already built into those loggers are available uh, uh, you know, for this mode and, and this contest. And so uh, you would be wanting to, uh, to use, use those. If you just used uh, WSJTX by itself, for example, you wouldn't have any of those capabilities. So those two loggers, if you move over to the left and look at what modem they use, N1MM uh, interfaces to WSJTX, and it does so in a, um, in a connection way that it exchanges messages to WSJTX directly. And so when you're operating the contest, you actually operate from the WSJTX window and you can have, uh, of course you have N1MM running, you can see the scoring and so forth, but uh, the dupe checking, the, the highlighting of calls and everything shows up in WSJTX. So that's really where your focus of attention is. In write log, uh, there's a little bit of a different approach. Uh, Wayne took the WSJTX source code, which is open source, by the way, and that's why there's a number of derivative products like uh, DigiWrite, MSHV, and JTDX, which you may have heard of. And so he developed this uh, module called DigiWrite, and it's um, it's uh, similar to ReadyWrite, if you're familiar with, with WriteLog. ReadyWrite is the module that uh, does uh, radio teletype. Um, the modem for um, uh, for write log and interfaces uh, in turn to things like MMTTY and two tone, but DigiWrite is focused just on FT4 and FT8 and has a completely different user interface than WSJTX. And so this is where innovation by other people um, in the software development area can um, can add uh, their contributions to to this technology. So uh, for serious contesters, I would think that you would be wanting to use one of those two systems. However, the MSHV uh, software written by uh, LZ2HV uh, and uh, team uh, has a uh, complete uh, WWDigi module in their software. And uh, the uh, uh, version that was introduced a couple of weeks ago, 2.24, will handle uh, Cabrillo uh, log exporting and will handle both of the message sets and so forth uh, uh, completely. If you use WSJTX uh, standalone, the fourth item on this list, if you're in the contest mode and you get use the shorter messages, that will export uh, uh, Cabrillo log. But if you switch over and work some non-contesters on the default mode, that is with the signal report and uh, grid square in the in the message set, uh, you'll want to export your log uh, as an ADIF and run it through the converter that's on the WWDigi website before you get the Cabrillo log. That way you get both uh, kinds of QSOs in, in the log. And if you use JTDX, uh, there is no um, contest mode. The only mode really available to you there is the, the standard daily mode. You can still participate in the contest, uh, but at the end, you, of course, you'll just like um, in WSJTX, because of those um, uh, contacts or QSOs that, um, that have the signal report in it, you'll want to run the log through uh, an ADIF uh, converter. So here's what the uh, messages look like for, uh, it says uh, North America VHF contest mode, so that may be a little bit confusing. It just turns out that those messages are exactly what's needed for the WWDigi um, contest. So WSJTX didn't have any need to um, you know, put another title on this. So we just, uh, you just select that mode in, in the software. So if you're running N1MM, for example, or WSJTX by itself, then uh, you would just select this, uh, this contest mode. And these are the default messages you get. And you see they're labeled uh, TX1 through TX6. In this particular set, TX1 and TX2 are the same message. And so I've grayed out TX1 because it's not used. 
And the way this works is that there's an automatic sequencer you can enable. And so as you're talking with your QSO partner, it just steps through these messages in order because if you know anything about this uh, technology, it's not like CW or uh, RIDI or, or sideband where as the message is being transmitted, you're receiving it either on the screen or in your brain, uh, you know, character by character and it unfolds. Uh, and once you get the last character, you've got the message and you're off and going. In this technology, you get nothing there's nothing on the screen until the end of the transmission cycle. And all of a sudden it flashes up there. And then there's like a one or two second um, dead period before the next transmission cycle starts. That is your transmission. And so the decision time for the operator is uh, greatly reduced. And in a contest situation, especially with FT4 is almost impossible. So that's why there's this automatic sequencing that can be enabled so that the software automatically knows what message to send based on what it received. So an example of that would be if um, TX2 were sent by your QSO partner, and if you received it okay, then your software will respond with TX3. But if you did not receive TX2, it, your software will repeat your uh, previous message, which in this case would have been TX6, the, the CQ message. And so the software automatically knows what to, what to do. So here's the same set of messages for uh, two QSO partners. I picked uh, ISTOC S52D and Don Hill AA5AU. You can see they got the same messages except that the, the order of their call signs are reduced. You always send the other station's call sign followed by your call sign and then the other information in the, in the message. And if you put this together in a QSO, here's what it looks like. So ISTOC would start off with TX6, which is a CQ message. Um, and that would elicit TX2 from AA5AU if, uh, if he had selected S52D to work. His software will automatically send TX2. If that's received uh, satisfactorily by uh, S52D, then uh, he sends TX3 and so on uh, through, the, through the QSO. And so uh, at the end, what would happen is uh, they finish the QSO and um, after um, uh, at, at, after um, uh, Don sends his QSL message, which is TX4 there, RR73, um, his talk would follow up with 73. Now, that's really not necessary, but if you think about this, this mode, there has to be an even number of messages. And so uh, at this point, his talk has, uh, has to do one of two things, either send a CQ message or send a 73 message. Now, in the future, we're hoping to have a tail ending uh, capability where if someone else had called in in parallel with Don's TX4 message, because you know they would be on another audio frequency, then in uh, step five there is talk to go directly to them. But in a normal QSO, if there was nobody else on the air, uh, he would send uh, 73. And then in stage six there, that's a receive cycle for S52D, he would look for somebody else to call in. If no one called in, he'd go back and do a CQ. So you can see it would, he'd go through six cycles here if no one else called in. But if someone did call in in that the last cycle, he doesn't have to go back and do the CQ. He can go back and respond with his TX3 message. And so now he's in a loop where there's only four uh, transmit cycles going on. So that'll take a minute with FT8, but just 30 seconds with FT4 on a, on a single radio. And so in a contest situation, hopefully there are enough people uh, available to work and uh, you could be for the most part in this cycle of, uh, of four transmission uh, cycles. Now the default mode, so these are the standard everyday messages. So this is if you were uh, not in a contest or if you're in the contest, but working a, a so-called non-contester, they could be using these messages. And here's what it would look like if both stations were using those messages. And you can see now uh, TX1 and TX2 are different because we need all those messages to get both the grid square and the signal to noise ratio uh, transmitted uh, both ways. And putting that together in a QSO, it would look like this. You can see, again, starting off with the uh, CQ message, TX6 and then going to uh, TX1 with the grid square, and then TX2 and 3 exchange the uh, SNRs, and then the last two messages are the, uh, are the QSL messages. 
And again, I'll point out that message six is a redundant QSL message. This is one of the things that some people um, don't quite get sometimes about this technology. You can see TX4, there's an R there. That's a QSL that AA5AU has received the signal report and grid square uh, of S52D. So he doesn't need any more information. That's his final transmission. And then in, t in um, step five, TX4, S52 sends RR73, which is his QSL, uh, telling AA5AU that he's received everything. So at that point, the QSO is complete. Uh, all the information has been exchanged. Both stations have confirmed the, uh, the, the exchange of information and it's over, but we're on an odd cycle there. And so again, there has to be uh, a receive cycle that, that follows that from S52's uh, standpoint. So here's what would happen if uh, during that, uh, that, receive, that last receive cycle where A5AU sends a 73 message, I'm claiming that that's really redundant in terms of the QSO, but during that same cycle, another station could be calling S52D, and in this case, it's kilowatt six Yankee Tango calls in that same cycle, cycle number six, but he's using his TX1 message, and what that will do is trigger uh, S52 software to go into TX2, which is the next message in his set, and send a signal report to K6YT, and so if people continue to call in, you can see that you can do uh, basically uh, four uh, cycles here with um, uh, the standard messages once you, get, um, once you get rolling. Now, what happens if we complicate this by saying, what if one QSO partner is running the standard messages, the everyday messages with signal report, and the other is running the, the so-called contest suite of messages, which is grid square. And so these two examples are where, uh, in one case, the contester is CQing, in the other case, the non-contester is CQing. I won't go through this uh, in detail, it's the same kind of sequences, but the point here is that they integrate perfectly. There's no wasted time. Um, it takes uh, six cycles for uh, uh, when the non-contester is, is CQing but um, you can see that it uh, integrates perfectly. So if both stations are set up to do automatic sequencing that I described earlier, and they're running these two different sets, the software automatically um, uh, interoperates perfectly with no wasted time. Now you can see that in the non-contest or CQ example, that JA1XS sends a signal report, but the contest um, sequence doesn't need that. They've already received the grid square, and so it just sends the uh, the message that is uh, the QSL message with their uh, with their grid square, and that triggers the non-contester software to send RR73, which is the final confirmation. So, the uh, the two software sets uh, very ingeniously uh, work well together. And like I said earlier, uh, this is great from a mechanical standpoint, from a technical standpoint, but um, where it gets dicey is if the um, the uh, non-contester notices that he didn't get a signal report and then struggles to take it out of automatic sequencing and, and tries to get the, uh, the signal report. And here's an example of that. So in this case, uh, JA1XS says, wait a minute, I didn't get a signal report. He sent RR73. So I'm gonna send my signal report again and uh, hope that, uh, that he receives it, which should trigger his signal report. And of course that never happens because the contester is not running the contest set or the message set that has the signal report message in it. And so what'll happen is this will go on for a while until one of them gives up or gets tired. And uh, in the end, there's probably not gonna be a QSO and there's gonna be a whole bunch of uh, time wasted. Um, another example of what can happen is that the non-contester could send TX2 and this is, kind of an unfortunate uh, fallout of everyday operating. Uh, and oftentimes you'll see this on the air outside of a contest is that even though I said that uh, the, the first message is um, the, uh, the grid square message, oftentimes the QSO partner will skip that and go directly to the signal report. And I think in the mind of everyday um, QSO partners, they're thinking, look, I'm, I'm just exchanging uh, uh, signal reports and the grid square is nice to know, but it's not necessary. And so from that 
kind of human perspective, uh, the TX1 is often skipped. Well, that's disastrous for this contest because that's exactly the information that's needed in the exchange. And so you can get into the same kind of uh, struggle between the two QSO partners as they uh, try to get the information from each other. So the net uh, result of all of this uh, is the following uh, recommendation. So if you're operating in the daily subbands, <clears throat> You're, uh, the majority of the people, in fact, all the people that should be you, you find there should be running the, uh, the, the daily uh, messages, that is the ones with signal report and, and grid square. So there you want to switch your software over to the default mode, the, the standard non-contest everyday mode. If you're operating in the WWDigi subbands that we've recommended for where the contest is going to take place, you ought to run the contest mode because that's the shorter message set and most everybody there will be running um, the contest mode. Now what can happen, and so getting back to the subbands, the advice is never ever run the contest mode there. Even though I said that it'll interoperate, you just don't want to do that because the probability is extremely high that anybody that's in those daily subbands is not in the contest, may not even be aware of the contest, and it's going to be very confusing if you send these uh, messages that don't have uh, a signal report in it. So that's an absolute no-no, don't do that. On the other side though, some non-contesters may see the activity in the, uh, the subbands that we've designated for the contest and may uh, wander in there and try to work you. And so that's where uh, it can get dicey and where you may have to take it out of automatic mode and try to uh, complete the, uh, the, the, the contest or the, uh, the contact. Now, if the non-contester starts with TX1 and sends a grid square, you're golden. Now, all you have to worry about is whether he's going to be concerned that he doesn't get a signal report. And as long as he can survive that, um, you'll wind up with a good QSO and you can go on. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. If he doesn't get a signal report, maybe he won't log the QSO and I could get a nil. Well, if he doesn't know uh, enough to, uh, to, to uh, realize that he's in a contest or that the signal report isn't needed, chances are he's not going to send in a, a log. And so you're not going to, it's not going to be a nil because the only way we can give you a nil in log checking is if we have both logs. So my recommendation, if I were operating the contest, I would take the chance of getting a few nils because I'd get a lot of contacts that uh, were not nils uh, in this in this particular situation, so I'd go ahead and log it because the contest uh, the contact is good. Uh, you exchange grid squares. Uh, the the contact itself was solid. It's just a question of whether the QSO partner uh, turns in a log without the QSO in it. So um, dynamic messaging. What I mean by this is um, what I talked about earlier about switching between these two message sets. So you might say, well, gee, if uh, non-contester calls me, uh, I'll just instantly switch over to that message set and finish the QSO and we won't have this struggle that, you know, that I described earlier. Well, um, in theory, you can do that, but practically right now, the way the software works, it doesn't happen fast enough. So for example, in WSGTX, uh, you can set it up with two configurations and instantly go between the two message sets. But when you do that, you lose whatever's on the screen. So for example, if you'd started a QSO, somebody had called you, you'll lose that call. So you'd quickly have to type it in or figure out how to get it into your uh, uh, screen to be able to continue on with the QSO. So um, it's really not uh, feasible, even though you can, um, you can switch pretty quickly. What is good about this is that, as I said, if you wanted to go down into the, the standard uh, uh, daily frequencies and work some FT8, um, non-contesters, you just click that, you know, when you finish your last QSO, move down there and you're good to go. It only takes a couple seconds to, to switch over. It's just not uh, dynamically sound to do it in the middle of a, of a QSO. DigiWrite uh, has a different way of doing the same thing. They have uh, two selections for what the uh, exchange is, and so you just quickly uh, select uh, one of those. But again, if you do it in the middle of a QSO, you lose the information that's in the QSO, including the call sign of the of the other station. Okay, so FT8 versus uh, FT4. Why do we have both of those in the same contest and uh, why, you know, wh which one do you use at, at which time? Well, FT4 is a faster version. It's twice as fast as FT8. 
So nominally, you would want to be using FT4 most of the time. However, uh, there are some instances, uh, a couple that I can think of, where you might want to use FT8. Uh, what if the rate drops off uh, later on in the contest, as it does in, in many contests? The advantage of FT4's uh, higher speed is uh, not so important anymore. Uh, you may have enough time between uh, contacts that uh, that uh, 2x speed is just not uh, valuable. And so in that case, if you switch over to FT8, you now have um, another uh, 4 or 5 dB of sensitivity. You can work weaker signals, signals that are further away or just another layer of uh, people that are active on the band that you can add QSOs uh, to, your, um, to your log. And you can also go down and work non uh, contest or QSOs because most of them are going to be, uh, you know, on, on FT8 down in the FT8 uh, uh, subband. So it's a way of, uh, of uh, um, really adding uh, QSOs to the log. And this is one element of tactics and strategy that you can use in the contest. So you may think that this is kind of a dumbbell uh, mode, the FT modes. It's all automatic and robotic, and uh, there's nothing for the operator to do. Well, this is an example of something that the operator has to uh, to make dynamically uh, during the contest and decide which mode he wants to be on in order to optimize his his score. These are the subbands that we've picked uh, for the contest. We basically went into the prime ready contest area from uh, X080 to X100. Uh, on all the bands except uh, 160 is a, a bit different, and uh, divided that 20 kilohertz up into the first 10 kilohertz is used for FT4, the second uh, 10 kilohertz is used for FT8. And so it's pretty easy uh, to remember. Unmuted. Any of the software you use, these get programmed in, so when you switch bands, it automatically takes your, uh, your transmitter there. And what we recommend is that you set your dial frequency on even frequencies, so you'd uh, say on um, on 40 meters, you'd start at 7080, and then you'd have uh, you know your two or three kilohertz uh, bandwidth of your of your receiver that you'd see all the signals in that area. If you wanted to, if it was too crowded, or if you'd worked everybody in in that segment at that point in time, and you wanted to move up, you should move up to 7082 or 7084. You want to go in even increments, and if everybody adheres to that convention then they're going to be lined up. Because you see, if uh, I were on uh, 7081 and you were on 7082, uh, I might uh, see your signal uh, in the top part of my passband, but you might not see me if I was down lower in my passband. I'd be below your passband. So it behooves you to be on even uh, numbers, and it'll increase the probability that the, uh, the stations that you see within your passband will uh, be able to hear you and you'll be able to, to work each other. One of the things, if you haven't already noticed about this technology is that in almost all cases, the order of the QSO phases, that is the messages that are sent in a QSO, are reversed from what they are in the classic mode, CW, sideband, and ready. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison. You can see on the left that we send CQ, the second phase of the QSO is a pileup or, or one station calling in. The third phase is uh, the CQ or the running station sending their report. And then the fourth phase is the uh, search and pounce station returning their report. And then it cycles back to a CQ. Uh, actually, what usually happens is uh, you say thank you, but that tells everybody else in the world that you're open for uh, for the next caller, and that's uh, equivalent to a CQ. So it's really a, a cycle of four, uh, four phases. And WSJTX is just the opposite, because when you CQ, you send your report. And so the callers already have your report, and when they call, they don't just give their call sign, they give their report. So by the time you get through the CQ and pileup stage, both, sta both stations, QSO partners, have already sent their report. Now, they, the QSO isn't over at that point because then there needs to be a confirmation. And so um, the CQR in step three there has to send uh, their QSL message. And uh, at, uh, in, in theory, the QSO is over. But again, as I said earlier, that's, only, that's an odd number of, of transmission cycles. And so the CQR has to get back in sync and, um, and CQ again. And so... Um, what happens there is that um, the uh, QSO partner sends RR73, 
that um, uh, he has everything, and then it cycles back and uh, goes into uh, 73 message, which again is equivalent to uh, a, Q, uh, a CQ message, and the cycle can start over again with another call. But what this means is that the QSL messages are delayed, or, or actually uh, happen one message sooner in this technology, and it can be very confusing if you've done decades of contesting in the classic modes and the uh, QSO phases are reversed. So think about that, get your own mental model about uh, how all that works so that um, uh, you don't get confused in the, in the middle of a contest uh, in, in the flurry of, of these QSO phases going by. One of the interesting things uh, and uh, unique things about this, uh, this technology is that everybody can and actually should be on unique audio frequencies. In other words, there should be a lot less of the situation where you call a CQing station on their audio frequency. It's still done, but it's considered um, in bad taste because uh, it can obscure, if two or more signals call, then uh, they can uh, potentially interfere with each other. And there's no reason to do that because everybody has a skimmer-like uh, interface, as I said earlier. So. Uh, people can call on different frequencies. In other words, you can find a clear frequency and stay there uh, for the entire contest or for a portion of the contest while you're working other people in the passband that are on other frequencies. So this makes tail ending uh, a dream because there's no interference between the tail enders and pileups don't obscure signals. So um, when you have a pileup, that is if you have three or four stations calling you, they're all on different frequencies, you copy all of them perfectly and you can select the one that, uh, that you want to work, and then you can roll into the next ones automatically uh, if, they're, you know, if they're still there. So for log submittal, um, as I alluded to earlier, there's uh, two methods. If your software outputs a valid uh, Cabrillo log, then we have a web page that you can upload that to on the, on the uh, WWDigi website. If, you, uh, if your software outputs ADIF, or needs to output the ADIF file in order to have both non-contest and contest QSOs, then we have a ADIF converter that takes uh, the log and automatically converts it to uh, Cabrillo and will submit it for you. So you just go to the appropriate page there to, uh, to submit your log. And as with uh, all of the uh, WWDX contests, there's a five-day uh, log submittal, which is Friday uh, following the, the contest weekend. So your submittal uh, method, this is just a summary. Uh, if you're using N1MM or write log, you can uh, use the, they both will output a Cambria log that has uh, both standard uh, and contest QSOs in it. MSHV does the same. WSJTX will output a Cabrillo log, but only for the uh, North America or for the uh, WWDigi uh, contest uh, message uh, QSOs. And so if you uh, switch over and work some non-contesters, you'll want to output your ADIF log so that you have both types of QSOs uh, in there. And then JTDX can only do uh, standard QSOs. And so of course that would use ADIF. Uh, we have a, a really nice plaque uh, sponsorship program, which is run by the uh, Slovenian Son Contest Club. So for those of us in North America, it's an opportunity to get a European flavor uh, contest plaque, which is uh, quite a bit different than the, the plaques that we have here and uh, really a nice trophy. So uh, that's a great program. And uh, Tini S58 is uh, the president of the Slovenia Contest Club and he's heading up that program right now. So you can contact him if you'd like to uh, sponsor a plaque. We have uh, eight practice sessions. Uh, uh, set up between now and the contest. They're basically on Friday evening local time for either Europe or uh, North America. So on each Friday for the next four Fridays, we've got two one-hour practice sessions, one uh, earlier um, in the day for a European evening and one later in the day for a North America uh, evening, as you can see here. Uh, we had one glitch. This was discovered after the uh, the webinar we had yesterday, someone pointed out to me that I neglected to uh, notice that the uh, worldwide uh, RIDI contest sponsored by the SARTG is held on the uh, weekend of August 17th, and it starts at 00 Zulu. So we certainly don't want to uh, interfere with that by putting a practice uh, in the middle of the prime um, uh, RIDI subband. So we've moved that time for that uh, practice only back two hours 
to 23 Zulu to 00, zero Zulu on uh, on Friday. Oh, and by the way, our um, our log submittal process is all up and running. We think it's working correctly from our test logs. But what we'd like you to do is to submit your practice logs these next Fridays and see if it works good for you. And uh, you'll see uh, how it works. And we'll get to see that uh, we don't have any additional bugs that we need to uh, work on in that. So in terms of resources, there are a number of, of websites that are available that I've uh, listed here. As I said, this slide set is on the uh, uh, WWDigi uh, homepage just below the announcement for these webinars. And I'll change that announcement for the webinars over to a link that goes to the, um, the recording of the webinar. Um, and so that'll be uh, permanently there so you can get to it just by going to, uh, to our site. And then there are a number of email discussion lists uh, that you can get into with uh, the various uh, software uh, activities or the first one there, the RTT Digital Group is a new group that was uh, started up this past year uh, that um, talks about both RIDI uh, and these new digital modes, but primarily the traffic is, uh, is the new digital modes. Most of the RIDI only traffic is back on the original uh, RIDI reflector, which is still still going on. So I'd like to give a big thanks to uh, a large group of people that has really supported getting this going, this contest going in a very short order. Uh, the three uh, people there at the top on the on contest uh, uh, committee that will be ongoing, helping with the log checking and uh, various uh, ongoing uh, work with the uh, uh, with the contest. And then what I call my so-called uh, kitchen cabinet, which are a number of people that I turn to for advice and to bounce ideas off of you can see listed here. Randy there at the top of the list uh, has been tremendous uh, in that regard and has uh, put up the website almost within um, about 24 or 48 hours after we um, decided to do this contest. He had uh, the draft of the first website up and running. Uh, you can see it's patterned after the other worldwide uh, websites and it's linked from them so they're all uh, um, interconnected but um, he's done a, a great job there. There's a lot of uh, good information on our website, a lot of FAQs that we've put up there, and uh, I'll continue to add to that as, um, as other uh, important questions come in. And then of course, uh, we couldn't do any of this without the supporters, uh, particularly the WSJTX development team with Joe Taylor, K1JT, and, and the folks that are uh, working with him. Uh, Wayne is, is the uh, W5XD is the author of WriteLog, and he's not on this list because of his write log uh, contribution, although that was uh, certainly a big contribution. But uh, he has been instrumental in uh, a lot of discussions I've had about various aspects of this contest. For example, the shots that I showed earlier of the uh, flex radio with the, um, uh, what the RF signal looked like with, with uh, the uh, multi-streaming uh, QSOs, uh, that was all done by, by Wayne. He's played with some ideas on, uh, uh, using pre-distortion, for example, to uh, try to reduce the IMD uh, of, of that situation. And so we've had some really good uh, uh, conversations about uh, different messaging techniques uh, in the software and so on and so forth. And then uh, we've had a number of enthusiastic people that have provided uh, some great, great feedback as, as we rolled out this uh, contest. So to wrap up, uh, Despite all the detail that I've rushed through here uh, in this seminar, uh, the end goal is uh, to just relax and have fun. Understand that this contest is a work in progress. Uh, the first uh, ever uh, uh, inaugural event is gonna be in uh, three or four weeks. And so uh, there's lots to learn, not just about uh, the aspects of the contest itself, but as operators, uh, what are the best practices to, uh, to be successful in, in this contest? So I'm sure we're gonna learn a lot we um, are already debating uh, various scenarios that have come up. I've gone over a few, but I'm sure there's some that uh, we haven't even thought about that uh, we'll learn about once we get uh, thousands of people on the air uh, interacting with each other. Uh, the next, um, in the following years, we intend to have the contest on the last full weekend in August. Uh, that's not the case this year because uh, this will be the last year of the Slovenian Contest Club running their uh, ready uh, contest and they're going to hand that weekend over to us. So now we'll have four months in a row where the last full weekend of the, of the month is the worldwide DX contest, one of each of the, of the four modes. So things we can look forward to in the future are uh, this thank you 
uh, feature where when you give your last QSL message, uh, we hope to have a special message where you can send the report to the next caller. So you can cut out QSO uh, phases and uh, get even uh, faster speeds. We hope to solve the multiple parallel QSO uh, issue without using uh, IMD in the process and being able to add uh, signal reports back into, uh, into the, the exchange. So that's all I have. I'll uh, turn it over to, to Mark and Ken, uh, see if there are any questions that people have and uh, let them uh, moderate that and I'll be happy to answer uh, whatever is on people's minds. All right, Ed, very good. So uh, first question comes in about logging programs and can you use the N3, was it FJP uh, logging program? Do you know if that's uh, doable for this contest? You know, I haven't uh, specifically looked at it, but I'm 100% sure that uh, the answer is no. <clears throat> and the reason is that it's not, um, I don't believe it's interfaced to uh, WSJTX in a way that um, would would make it um, useful. In other words, um, if it is interfaced, it may not uh, be able to to add those those contest log features that I talked about that write log and N1MM have. And so, if that's not the case, then there's really no benefit. It's really more confusing and uh, probably better just to use WSJTX directly or uh, MSHV is a good alternative. Um, if I if I weren't using a contest logger, I would seriously look at MSHV. Okay, good. Uh, we've got one here. It says uh, not all countries allow hams to transmit more than one signal per band. Multiple parallel QSOs could be a big disadvantage for them. Um, uh, please consider that rule. Well, yeah. So that's that's a that's an excellent point. I appreciate that input. Uh, it's one that um, that we're going to have to sort through because you know from one point of view. Uh, it's one signal, right? It's a, it's a single sideband signal with only two audio or three audio frequencies in it as compared to a large number of audio frequencies if it were sideband. So, you know, it's arguable whether it's one signal or, uh, or multiple signals, but uh, still that's a, that's a good point and we'll have to understand what the, what the regulations will, will allow in, in those countries. And by the way, don't assume that the way we achieve multiple parallel QSOs is by having multiple signals. So don't make that one-to-one -one correlation. There are other methods that, um, that are being looked at to achieve that. So um, uh, keep that in mind that the, the transmitting signal, the FOX in other words in the DX domain um, that it is transmitting separate audio frequencies right now, we may not use that method in the, in the future. For one reason it creates IMD, right? So uh, um, keep that in, in mind. But anyway, that's an excellent question and one that, that needs to be considered going forward. Okay, next question. Um, working non-contesters, -co um, the logs are cross-checked. Uh, if so, what about nine, if non-contesters don't send in their log, does that affect your score? Uh, no, just like <clears throat> it's the same thing with any other contest. Uh, uh, we only, we can only cross-check the logs we receive. And so, um, there's no penalty for, um, uh, and in fact, as I said in, in the presentation here, it's actually somewhat of an advantage because to the extent that um, you have a QSO with a non-contester and they get confused and think that they don't realize they're in the contest, for them it's just a normal QSO, and they didn't get a signal report from you, they may say, gee, I don't think that's a valid QSO, I'm not going to log it. I've had a lot of FT... Uh, QSO partners email me um, and uh, tell me that. And so, um, but I think if if that's the description of what happens with that person, I think it's also highly correlated that they're not going to be turning in a log. And so you're kind of uh, saved by the bell, if you will, um, and, uh, and not going to get a nil. So in my opinion, um, at least right now until I experience something different, uh, I would log those, those con as long as you got the grid square, you gotta have a valid uh, uh, contact. But if you're worried that the non-contester may not send in a log and you might get a nil, I think that's a pretty low probability uh, that they're gonna send in a, in a log. And so uh, I think you're pretty safe to go ahead and, and log the contact, but it's up to you. You know, it's, we just make the rules, you, you need to figure out uh, how you wanna operate the contest and you may feel uh, that if you're not sure that they logged it, 
that um, that you don't want to put in your log, and so that's your choice. Okay, uh, from Pete, um, why not limit the event to the FT4 bands and stay away from uh, FT8 frequencies? Well, for a couple reasons. Um, one is that we want to be able to work non-contesters. Remember, that's one of the points of the vision is being able to work anybody, whether they're in the contest or not, to be all-inclusive and to increase the activity as much as we can. Uh, secondly, uh, FT8 has a lower sensitivity. You can work weaker stations. And so, uh, towards, especially towards the end of the contest, when the rate drops off, this allows you to go off and work uh, some more stations that you wouldn't otherwise be able to work on FT4. So, um, um, I, I think it's um, I, I, I think it's a really good idea to have both modes and to be able to have that strategy element in your operating to decide, gee, do I want to use a slightly less sensitive mode at a higher rate or a more sensitive, you know, deeper sensitivity mode? Um, with uh, with a slower rate, and um, so I, I think it just adds another dimension to contest. You know, one of the the common um, uh, critiques we get from the uh, naysayers of these new uh, digital modes is that oh, it's all automated, and you know, there's nothing for the operator to do. Well, if you you know objectively look at it, they're new modes, and because they're new there's some different aspects compared to what we're used to with classic modes. And this is a good example of one of being able to uh, choose a, a variation on the, on the communication protocol to uh, trade off speed for, uh, for sensitivity. So um, that's a, a long answer to the question, but uh, we're, we're pretty bullish about, uh, about doing, uh, about doing both modes. And um the, the question implied that there were FT subbands, and there sort of are, uh, because when F, I mean FT4 subbands, because when FT4 came out, uh, the WSJTX team uh, wanted to um, recommend some places where people could meet up. I mean, you, you want to be able to find people, and so they recommended some some areas. Um, but for the contest. Uh, we wanted to be very explicit about where people were, and we wanted a much wider area than what um, you might have on an everyday uh, basis. And so that's why we specified uh, what we did for the for the contest area. Okay, um, here's one from Rusty W6OAT. Will logging programs show dupes regardless of whether the station has worked on FT4 or FT8? Uh, the answer is yes, because the logging uh, programs um, are kind of uh, kind of don't care which. I mean, it's all you, you can you can only work a station on uh, once per per band, uh, not per mode per band. And so, uh, if you're using N1MM or write log, they're duping, which is the only way you're going to get duping. Um, they will uh, dupe regardless of, of mode, so uh, you don't have that that confusion. Basically, you can if you're using those logging programs, you can just ignore mode. You can pick the mode that makes sense for what you want to do, whether it's rate or sensitivity or DX or whatever, and where you're operating, what subband you're operating on, and not have to think about how it affects your score or your duping or anything about how the, the software is operating. So it, it, it works pretty transparently. Okay, good. What band plan will be used for the practice sessions? Same as the contest. So just like other um, contests, uh, you, you just pretend that the contest is going on. Do exactly what you do uh, in, in the contest. Okay. Uh, let's see, in daily FT8 operation, incorrect clock synchronization reduces the effective uh, auto sequence. How will this be handled? Uh, I'm not sure what the question is. Um, if, you're, if, you're not, if your clock isn't synchronized, uh, then you're going to have that problem, and so you're going to have a frustrating time operating. I'm not, uh, maybe I missed the question. I don't, I don't see a question in there. Okay. Next question from Dave K3 Zulu Japan. Um, hi Ed. Um, maximum permissible power is 1500 watts output. What are competitors likely to be actually using? Um, what are the pros cons of QRP low power and high power? Okay, that's a that's a great question, Dave. In fact, on the website we have a FAQ uh, on that, and uh, so people can can access that whenever they want. Um, 
you know, when we when we started out, the initial thinking on the rules was to not have a high power um, uh, category. You know, one of the things that's touted about these modes is, quote unquote, their weak signal modes. Well, um, there are two factors here. One is that um, weak signal doesn't mean low power. All it means is weak signal. Um, there are lots of times when I'm running a kilowatt from a good station and I can't complete a QSO to somebody on the other part of the world because I'm just too weak. You know, the propagation path is such that uh, despite the power and the robustness of my station that uh, I can't complete the, the QSO. So even on these modes, there may be times when you'll need more power, more than QRP or more than, a, than 100 watts. I can remember when I first started working the JT modes and was trying to work um, some DX, uh, I remember a, a fellow was out um, on E51, and uh, this was a couple years ago, 10 meters was in and out, and I was trying really hard to get that on, on 10 meters. And we tried for several days, and I had to increase the power uh, much higher. Uh, I think I went up to 500 watts in order to work him. And um, I, we just, we couldn't complete the QSO otherwise, even though this is quote unquote a weak signal mode. Uh, the other uh, thought is that um, if we did not have a high power category, the people, there are inevitably gonna be people running high power. And it means that they uh, are not, you know, legal in the, in the contest rules. And so uh, we, decided to try the first contest with the high power category and see how it works. I suspect on a practical matter that the vast majority of people are gonna be running 100 watts or less. Uh, there's no need to run more power. And in fact, that's just good operating whether you're in a contest or not, is to only use the amount of power that, that's needed. And that, that's what all operators ought to be uh, operating with. But that's one of the things we'll be looking at um, as we, um, as we go forward with uh, with running the contest to see if uh, if that's a major issue or not uh, going forward, but I think I think it's a fallacy for people to uh, absolutely equate a weak signal uh, reception technology like this with low power. It's just uh, to me it's analogous to uh, saying that QRP stations have to have crummy antennas; they have to have indoor antennas, or they can't use uh, stacked beams. Well, of course you can. Uh, you can run low power with uh, with a great location and, and a great antenna farm. Okay, thanks, Ed. Um, will a log with multiple parallel QSOs be processed as valid at this time? Uh, I'm imagining creative solutions using multiple radios and separate antennas emerging from innovative participants, that's the way to put it, which may not uh, run into uh, IMD problems. Uh, yes, absolutely. We, I, I have not uh, publicized that because I'm concerned about people slipping over and um, using the easy way out and using this fox and hound mode, and um, that's just going to create havoc on the on the band. So, um, if you know, as I understand the question, if uh, there's no IMD created, but but another solutions come up, absolutely. In fact, that's why I don't want to take the basic capability out of the rules because I want to have an incentive. I want to encourage the community, the worldwide community to come up with solutions to this. So what we're saying is um, we don't have a technical solution that we know about today, but if you can come up with one um, and not violate the other rules, such as the signal quality rule uh, in the, in, in the uh, WWDG rules, then, um, you know, go for it. Okay, great. And that question, by the way, came from uh, Jim K1IR. I forgot to uh, mention that. Um, okay, thanks, Jim. Yep. Question for uh, Ria. In 2RJ, a uh, question was raised today on the CQ contest reflector about band planning. Is band planning a component of planning this contest, and will there be limits as to what can be used in terms of bands? Uh, limits meaning uh, contest preferred segments. Uh, yes, if you go to Roman numeral two of the rules, uh, we outline exactly where this contest is going to take place. Uh, it's on one of the um, uh, later slides in this slide pack. Test. So it's basically um, on all bands except 160, we've got 20 kilohertz set aside, uh, the lower 10 kilohertz for FT4, the upper 10 kilohertz for FT8. And this is right smack in the middle of where RTTY contesting takes place. And so uh, it's probably the least offensive place we can operate this contest. 
Um, as you know, band planning is a uh, kind of a tar baby, sticky wicket sort of uh, topic. Uh, there are a number, uh, hundreds, thousands of people around the world that have laid claim to frequencies that they think that they own. And um, uh, so um, these are the, are the frequencies that we're wanting to, to take, uh, have the contest operate in. So below, um, on most bands, below these frequencies, like on 20 meters below uh, 080 is where the uh, FT8 subband is, where you'll find the so-called non-contesters. During the contest, you can go down there, use that message system and work them uh, and have those, content, those uh, QSOs in your log and they count for the contest because you've got the, the grid square exchange. Bill, I think it's N6ZFO, uh, JA's on 160 meters, uh, which frequencies? Again, go to the rules, uh, Roman numeral two, uh, after these two charts of, or lists of frequencies, there's a specific section for the JA's and it's not just a 160 problem, there's uh, issues on 40 and 80 as well, there are different frequencies. So I will refer you to that. I do not have them committed to memory, um, but um, that, that you can just get that from the website. Okay, last question, um, and, and I like this one. This is a, this is a good question uh, from Randy, K5ZD. What do you expect the winning score to be and how many QSOs? Any thoughts on that? You know, I, I did some modeling early on when we were uh, working on the, on the scoring, and I, I felt that we would be in the same scoring range as the other worldwide um, DX contests uh, in, in terms of uh, the types of what the top scores would be and so forth. In other words, uh, I don't expect them to be orders of magnitude different, but you know, I haven't looked at that recently. So we, we probably should go through and model that, but I, it's something I haven't, haven't done. So I don't have a specific uh, good answer for that. Yeah, it's just kind of an interesting thought, if uh, if nonetheless. So <laughs> he yeah. said, "Come, come on, I'll, I'll let you guys take that one up offline." <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all we have, Ed. Um, so anything else uh, before we close this out? Nope, I'm good. And uh, if people have questions, they can contact us by email or, as I say, go to the website. There's a, a, a lot of uh, FAQs there that may answer some of the of the questions. And of course, read through the rules. You learn a lot from that. Okay, well, thank you once again, Ed, uh, for putting this together uh, and uh, spending time with us. Again, thanks, everyone. Um, have a great evening. Take care, everyone. See you later. Bye-bye.